thank you all for coming to the breakout session entitled Philosophical Case for Conditionalism, presented by that handsome man right there. Daniel is a assistant teaching pastor at the Assemblies of God Church, and MD student here at Fuller. You're also going to the North Campus, aren't you? True. Uh, software analyst by trade and a father of three young children. Three is a good number. The paper he used to present at this conference was recently previewed at the Evangelical Philosophical Society's 2015 Far West Conference. Dan has also contributed to the Everything Day Hall website and the podcast. He's also a good friend of mine. So be nice. You guys have about 45 minutes. Choose whenever you want in about 10, 15 minutes. Great. And after that, you guys are free to go to the next planner, which will be about 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Okay. Be nice. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is me, Daniel Sinclair. If you want to follow up and see what other things I've written, you can go to wholereason.com. That's my personal blog. I probably get at least 50 visitors a day or a week. So I'm not a giant at all. <laughs> you know, as my pastor, as a pastor, my desire is to is to help Christians who have an intuitive discomfort with the eternal conscious torment view. And I want to encourage them that they have both a logical and scriptural basis for adopting conditionalism as a biblical alternative to the traditional view of hell. So in my presentation today, what I want to do is show you why I think you can rest assured that the traditional view is intellectually fragile. And that conditional immortality meets the demands of both justice and mercy. And in addition, I'm going to review the claims of universal reconciliation, the other minority view, in light of the three principles I've got here. So you already know that either yourself or there are others that you know have an intuitive discomfort with the eternal uh, torment view. And so I'm going to explain to you the, the top three reasons why I think this intuition is true and why conditionalism is a much superior view to the, both the traditional view and to some extent the universal view. And I will say ahead of time that the universalist view does have much to commend it from a philosophical perspective. Now, this scripture, uh, you know, how important is this doctrine? We've all kind of agreed that it's not an essential but among the secondary doctrines, I would argue that our view of eternal punishment is very important. And I want to base it just on this one carefully picked scripture. Hebrews, in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about Christ, let us move on to maturity, not laying again the foundation. And then he mentions three groups of foundational ideas, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Instructions about baptisms and the laying on of hands. All right, we all kind of admit these are important, although most of us don't have any theology of laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This is a foundational doctrine. It doesn't have to be one of the essentials by which we exclude one another. But I do think that it is important that we get this right and have a lot of personal circumspection about what we teach. What I'm going to do today is talk about the three views, although I'm promoting the conditional view. I'm going to run the other two views through my assertions and see how they come out. And I'm going to use a little color coding so you can kind of keep track of where we are. If we're talking about traditionalism, it's orange, conditionalism, yellow, and universalism, green. And I hope you can see those differences. And I'm not going to define the views because we've probably all at the point where we understand what we think they mean. But before I go into my the thesis, I want to talk at a larger view. If you haven't experienced the Wesleyan quadrangle or quadrilateral uh, before, you can thank me later. Um, this is a wonderful ex- a description of the spiritual authorities in the life of a Christian. And the way this works is scripture is at the top, it's inerrant, and it's in authority over the other three. But nobody understands scripture in isolation. We use tradition, experience, and reason to refine our understanding of scripture. So if any of us, universalists, traditionalists, conditionalists, are going to make a case, I think we're going to have to make a case in all of these areas. Now, I'm not going to do that today, of course. But I just want to talk about those areas very briefly. With regard to scripture, regarding conditionalism... The scriptural argument has been made in Ed's book, so I don't have to redo it. And actually, if you go to the Rethinking Hell website, podcast 4 and 7 discuss the relevant passages in detail from a conditionalist perspective. So I think this is work has been done, or is being done, so I think there is warrant for a scriptural conditionalism. Well, what about from a traditional point of view? You know, traditionalists have uh, most of the time said that the early church fathers were a monolith, essentially, and that they were all pretty much traditionalists. Uh, But, of course, recent work by Dr. Glenn Peoples, who's a philosopher from uh, New Zealand, has shown that there may have been some early fathers who were conditionalists. I know I even heard Jerry in an interview recently saying that Dr. Peoples' work has made him reconsider the idea that maybe there were some fathers uh, that were conditionalists. 
right? Am, am I quoting it correctly? All right. Uh, you can go find out uh, on our Rethinking Hell channel. Uh, Glenn's done a nice short video, and there's also an article if you look at afterlife.co.nz or something. All right, so if the work has been done in tradition, what about experience? Uh, the reason I, want, I went through this whole quadrilateral is because I want to talk about this. What is the role of experience in our truth-finding? You know, uh, atheist materialists love to say, I make only rational decisions, and my, int- my intuition uh, has nothing to do with it. My feelings have nothing to do with it. Now, we know that all of these are subjective, but I do think that they're very important, and even God demands that we use them. And experience is important in the conditionalist and also universalist journeys for this reason. Most of us had an intuitive discomfort with eternal conscious torment, and that motivated us to go back and re-examine the scriptures. Now, often, critics of of, uh, conditionalism have kind of made this genetic fallacy argument, where they say, well, you changed your hermeneutic based on your feelings... And that's why you're making this decision. And of course, we would say, it doesn't matter what motivated me to re-examine the scriptures. The question is, do you have a problem with my logic and my hermeneutic, right? So the, uh, the genetic fallacy needs to be dispensed with, uh, and the accusation that we've become liberal. I think most of us, evangelical, universalists, and conditionalists, would say we have a high view of scripture and have not modified our hermeneutic significantly. Well, I want to talk about three reasons why I think we need to consider experience as part of our epistemology. The first is what they call the wisdom of the crowd. The wisdom of the crowd says that a large group's aggregated answers to questions involving quantity estimation, general world knowledge, and spatial reasoning has generally been found to be as good as or often better than the answer given by any of the individuals within the group. Now, this is kind of a scientific approach, but what I want to say is that if a significant number of thoughtful individuals are offended by the seeming injustice of hell, we need to take note and not just dismiss it. If it's a one guy, who cares? If it's a lot of guys, maybe it's important. Well, there's another reason why we need to consider people's intuitive experience and feelings about justice or injustice. The second is that the Bible commands it. Now, where do I get such an audacious claim? Uh, what I think is in Romans 1.20, Paul is appealing not to, he's appealing to conscience and intuition. Look what he says here. Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities. They can clearly see something invisible. How do you see something invisible? It's the intuitions. Right? It's our experience of reality and of the creation that tells us that there is a God and what he is like. He goes on to argue that even our baseline conscience, apart from the knowledge of the law, is something that he takes as an important part of our epistemology and how we decide what is true. Uh, I think there's a third reason. I guess this thing is not going to go all the way to the bottom, so I'll read that. And that is we all operate this way. No one operates purely rationally. We all take note of our intuition, which is busily working in our subconscious to put things together and make sure they fit and warn us if something seems out of place. So I think experience is an important consideration. And I want to back this up. Remember I talked about the wisdom of the crowd. How many people have pointed to the traditional doctrine of hell as a stumbling block? Here's noted atheist Bertrand Russell. There is one very serious defect in my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is that he believed in hell. And of course he means the eternal conscious torment. I do not myself feel that any person who is profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. Now, this is not an isolated event. In many of the noted atheists, this is what they point to. Hell. The injustice of hell. The intuitive dislike of it. And often, traditionalists, and I'm a former traditionalist, we have kind of poo-pooed that and say, well, it's just their sinful nature. We have no concept of the holiness of God. And that is true. But as I said before, in Romans, he even appeals to their unredeemed intuition and conscience to have some idea of what God is like, so we just can't entirely dismiss it. Well, here's another one. Lewis Carroll, right? English writer, mathematician. <clears throat> I'm sorry, not a mathematician. Uh, the right, writer. I've got my notes for my next slide. Okay. When all has been considered, it seems to me to be the irresistible intuition that infinite punishment for finite sin would be unjust and therefore wrong. We feel that even weak and erring man would shrink from such an act, and we cannot conceive of God as acting on a lower standard of right and wrong. All right, well, I'm not saying that experience defines what's true. We're going to talk about philosophy today, which is this, the reason to pour part. But I want to go through this because I think we step over it as if it doesn't matter. All right, here's Mr. Hobbes, the English philosopher. I find it difficult to believe that God, who is the father of mercies, 
that doth in heaven and earth all that he will, and hath the hearts of all men in his, at his disposing, that worketh in men both to do and to will, and without whose free gift a man hath neither inclination to good nor repentance of evil, should punish men's transgressions without any end of time, and with all the extremity of torture that men can imagine, and more. All right, one last quote, just to show that there's a pattern that we should not ignore, and this is Robert Ingersoll, Civil War veteran, political leader, noted agnostic, although I, I would call him an atheist, but they say that God says to me, forgive your enemies, I say I do, but he says I will damn mine. God should be consistent. If he wants me to forgive my enemies, he should forgive his. I'm not saying I find no fault with his logic, but I want you to see what he's objecting to. God, I am asked to forgive enemies who can hurt me. God is only asked to forgive enemies who cannot hurt him. That's going to come back later. He certainly ought to be as generous as he asks us to be. Well, let's move on to reason. I just want you to see that there is some warrant that we should take into account experience. So, uh, Glenn Peoples has written a three-part exegetical argument that he thinks supports conditionalism. I think he does a good job, and that is, he notes these three points. The biblical question of immortality, whether or not the Bible says man is mortal or immortal. The biblical language of destruction, the idea that most of the time the final state is referred to with words like perish, destroy, and death, whereas there are many fewer references to eternal torment. And then the biblical vision of eternity, which is a wholly restored creation. And I think that my arguments sort of parallel that, but not entirely. And we'll see how it goes. So what I'm going to argue, not from a biblical point of view, but hopefully from a philosophical point of view, is that man is inherently mortal. And not immortal. So he doesn't have to suffer somewhere forever, which is part of some of the argument behind the traditional view of hell. Not, not everyone holds that, but that's one of the underpinnings of the traditional view. That if man is made in the image of God, i.e. immortal, which is you know, a specious, or questionable assumption then he must live somewhere, so if he's not in heaven, he's got to be punished. Uh, the second, which has no analog over here, is proportional finite justice. Right? I think uh, conditionalism proposes proportional finite justice, and as we'll see, universalism, I think, can meet this requirement as well. And the last is completely restored creation. Right? The idea that conditionalism should fit that better. Well, guys, let's go through, the, let's go through these three arguments quickly, and we'll run out each of our three views through them in the amount of time we have, which is not a lot. In argument one, inherent mortality. Well, I want to uh, bring three kind of philosophical arguments, not biblical arguments necessarily, for the idea that man is mortal and not immortal. The first is what I call the law of disintegration, the soul's dependence on the body, contingent existence, and bodily resurrection. So, the law of disintegration basically says that everything we see is headed for dissipation, for disintegration. It's basically what someone called the law of entropy. Now, I think as Christians, we've kind of I've stayed away from this argument because we associate it with physicalism or uh, atheistic materialism. But unless some other natural principle is introduced, I don't see why the soul is eternal rather than headed for dissolution like everything else we can observe. Everything is headed toward disintegration and death. All right. Here's the second one. The soul's dependence on the body. I'm just going to... Uh, read this quote here. I think this is, says it pretty well. Pietro Pompanazzi. He says, In us, intellect and will are not truly immaterial, but relatively and to a slight extent, so that our soul is essentially and truly mortal, mortal and only relatively immortal by virtue of its imperfect participation in an activity which, properly speaking, is performed only by the intelligences. Thus, even an analysis of the highest human faculty intellectual knowledge, reveals our inability to escape from our material condition. For this reason, philosophical arguments necessarily lead to the conclusion that since our soul is never devoid of materiality, it must be mortal. So I think we can all observe, whether it's Alzheimer's or just normal aging, that our soul's capacities are certainly affected by this disintegrated principle, and so I see no reason to believe that it's going to survive on its own. And I'm not saying you have to be a physicalist uh, to be a conditionalist. I'm just saying this is where the, the philosophy leads us. All right, what about contingent existence? We're all familiar with the cosmological argument for God's existence, where God is necessarily existent and we depend on that. And I think this truism is part of what supports the, immortal, the mortality of man. It is the father of all who imparts continuance. By the way, this is one of the fathers, church fathers, who we contend was a conditionalist, Irenaeus. It is the Father of all who imparts continuance forever and ever on those who are saved, 
who shall receive also length of days forever and ever, but he who shall reject it, deprives himself of the privilege of continuance forever and ever, shall justly not receive from him length of days forever and ever. All right, a lot of efforts and efforts in there. <laughs> but basically, man is contingently existent and is not necessarily or immortal or existent. All right, my last argument is the inherent, uh, is the bodily resurrection for mortality. And this is a kind of a, a nuanced argument, so hear me out. If judgment could, could be done in a, in a non-corporeal body, if we just experienced, if we, if we could be judged just as spirits, God could do that. But he provides instead a physical resurrection. Now, either because a physical body is necessary for existence, or at the very least we can say that it is not necessary for the soul to persist up until the resurrection. So this is kind of arguing for soul sleep. It is not necessary for judgment for a soul to persist because there is a resurrection. Because there is a reconstitution of our bodies, there is no need, necessary need, for continued soulical existence. Because we're all going to get new bodies for the resurrection, I mean for the judgment anyway. All right, so these are my arguments, and if this was my entire argument, you'd probably just say, well, um, I'm solid in my position, but I'm hopefully arranging them in increasingly, increasing importance and weight, and you'll be the judge of that. Uh, the problem with talking about immortality with traditionalists is, is, is that they've redefined the words immortality, death, and life. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. I, what I call a backwards exegesis, and I'm sorry if that's a little unkind, and an adoption of Platonic dualism. So I'm just saying, just out of, by definition, traditionalism says that man is essentially immortal. And that's not always true, but it's generally true. And I'm, so here I'm really explaining why. I'm not saying how they fall short in, in, in any more reason than they totally disagree with it. One of the things that I think they do is they redefine death, life, and immortality. So I want to discuss this. So here's a passage. It has been revealed through the King of Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death, and it's brought together, and see this couple here, life and immortality to life in the gospel. So what happens, and what makes this discussion difficult, is that the traditionalist now redefines death to mean separation from God. And the reason is, is because immortality has to be decoupled from life. Because they're now the immortal dead, the zombies. They have existence for eternity. And life means union with God, which I don't disagree with, but I think that this is our new definition. And so I'm going to argue that they're more complicated an unnecessary redefinition is part of what argues against them. So here's what a conditionalist would say, that death is the sentence under which sinners exist, leading to a ceasing of existence. Life is that we are under the auspices of life, and that is a necessary condition to receive immortality, which is eternal life. So life and immortality go together. Death is a sentence which leads to non-existence. And I think this simpler approach argues for conditionalism, but let's go a little farther. I would argue that immortality is never attributed to man, and I say this tongue-in-cheek, the scriptures teach clearly. I talked with Jerry, you know, all of us say the scriptures clearly support my, my position, and of course that means that we're all liars, and that we all have difficulties that we must explain. Uh, but I do think that God alone possesses immortality, we should be seekers for immortality, I didn't put the scripture references in, but you can probably think that hear them in your mind, we access immortality through the gospel, and that immortality will not be conferred upon us until the last trump or the time of resurrection. Under traditionalism, immortality is assumed, but mortality is what is taught. Well, let me go to the second reason why I think that traditionalism has this conclusion that man is immortal. I think it is engaged in what I call backwards exegesis. So regular, one of the rules of hermeneutics here is you start with the clear passages, like in the Gospels and the Epistles, for example. And you go to the unclear, the notorious Revelation. If you're going to found your doctrine on the book of Revelation, good luck with that. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Here's one. For God so of the world, they gave his one only son. Everyone who should believe in him shall not perish. All right, well, let's not bring our baggage. Let's, uh, the first blush, that seems to be perish. Die, cease to, you know, live. And then let's compare it to this one. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night. So the question is, do we take this as the foundation for our doctrine, and then go back and re-examine this? Or do we start with this, which is, I think, what a lot of traditionalists do, and then go back and say, well, perish doesn't really mean the simple word perish. It means separated from God. And then we do a big theology around that. Let's take another example. 
And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur of the beast and the false prophet. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do we start with this and then go back and say they will be punished with eternal destruction and say, well, they're not really destroyed. They're being destroyed. They're being ruined forever. As opposed to a destruction that is that they don't come back from. There's no more resurrection. Is destruction going to be an ongoing process because we assume this first? Or should we say, maybe this is true in its simplest form, and then we need to go look at this. And I'm saying that I think that's what's done. So what's happened here with immortality is that I think that somewhere along the line, not only do they have a backwards exposition, but they've assumed, they've assumed immortality. Now whether or not Platonic dualism came first, or eternal punishing and destruction came first, based on an assumption of immortality from the scriptures, I don't know. It's a cycle, but Plato did predate Christianity by 500 years. And if you don't think adoption of Platonism is, is a problem, you can just go search Google for Neoplatonism in Christianity and find all you can read. But here's some right here. The immortality of man was one of the foundational creeds of the philosophical religion of Platonism that was in part adopted by the Christian church. This is from uh, Harvard Theological Review, Werner Jaeger, nice theologian. All right, here's our boy. Augustine of Hippo, the utterance of Plato, the most pure and bright in all philosophy, scattered the clouds of error. I found that whatever truth I had read in the Platonists was in the writings of Paul, combined with the exaltation of thy grace. And I wonder if that Platonism in Christianity is not a corruption. And in this case, I think it is. All right, well, what about universalism? Now, universalism doesn't really assume immortality at the same level. It assumes a de facto immortality, right? That people are in purgatory, that they might repent, and then in hell, when hell proper begins. So, to the extent that they do assume an immortal soul, I would say they fall victim to the same critiques. But if you don't have these same kind of assumptions in your universalism, uh, at the very least, you have a de facto immortality, because God sustains them, right? Sustains them for eternity. Eh. So, is that a material difference? I don't know. So, universalism can skate by on this one. But, I just want you to read this quote. This is a discussion between... Uh, written by a universalist responding to a conditionalist, uh, Charles Hodge, I believe. So Andrew Jukes wrote this in 1867. And here's the discussion, and I want you to see how he, he basically says, look, we believe God sustains, we don't believe that men are immortal. And he thinks that's the material difference. Here, as I, I do not care to notice what appears to be mere conceptions, I will say nothing of Mr. Constable's often repeated statement that I make the doctrine of man's inalienable immortality the basis of my hope, of universal restoration. When on the contrary, I have distinctly stated that God alone has immortality because I have also declared that I believe man will exist forever. Mr. Constable may really not be able to see how a mortal creature may exist forever and how the final and blessed restoration of a mortal creature, which will yet exist forever, depends not on existing forever but on its participation in Christ's death and resurrection. So he is arguing for a kind of perceived immortality, but it's complicated. All right, so let me give a summary here. Traditionalism leans heavily on immortality and must redefine the terms life, death, and immortality. I think that argues against it. Because I've assumed, or I've tried to defend the idea that, immor- that mortality is the best reasoned uh, approach, uh, understanding of, of humanity and of the soul. Universalism also leans heavily on immortality and shares the awkward redefinition of words, but perhaps is not as dependent on immortality as traditionalism. Conditionalism denies inherent mortality and accommodates simpler, equally or more biblical and common sense use of these words. Okay. Argument two. Proportional finite justice. Remember this quote? Notice that he talked about infinite punishment for finite sin. That's one of the big moral accusations against the standard view. So let's talk about that. What is justice in biblical terms? Well, one of the things we can point out is lex talionis, the law of retaliation, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, punishment must fit the crime. This is, I think, the primary principle of justice in the scriptures that God expects us to not only practice, but to judge him by. Now, this view is pretty harsh. In fact, in this passage, it says, show no pity. If you go to the New Testament, Jesus may have actually softened our view. That even an eye for an eye is a little much. And of course, James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. So, what I'm saying is, if you move anywhere north of this, more severe, which is what traditionalism is about, you're way out of bounds, because Christ moved the the thing this way. So here's what I would say. The traditional view is not only beyond proportion, it's beyond mercy. It has no place in Christian theology. I know, that's that's quite an understatement. So let's talk about 
uh, traditionalism as far as suffering, and we'll talk about quantifying suffering later, if we define suffering as intensity times duration, the problem with traditionalism is that essentially it's something times infinity. So if we look at this uh, as purely a math problem, and of course when we talk about infinities we can get into trouble, I would say that there is no proportion in the traditional view. Even if you acknowledge that, you know, this guy suffers at level 2 for eternity and this guy is at 10, at any one time, sure, there's a differential. But the net, to me, is times infinity. That is, it's kind of hard to conceive of that being proportional at all. Well, let's talk about the traditional defenses of infant punishment, and I want to give a quick rebuttal, and I also want to mention that one of the things Jerry said stuck with me. He said, just because we try to take down the traditional view doesn't mean that our view is right. <laughs> just because we make a negative case against these guys doesn't mean that we have, we have to make a positive case. So I'm not saying that conditionalism is true because this is false. But I am saying that this is the king of the mountain, and it deserves to be punished. For <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the first argument. Here's John MacArthur. And, you know, I attend Fuller Seminary where if you say John MacArthur, you have never seen such evil stares. It's, it's worse than seeing Wayne Grudem in a classroom. <laughs> or, and almost as bad as saying anything critical of N.T. Wright. <laughs> in hell, that's my real experience, I tell you. N.T. Wright is a saint in Fuller. All right, can do no wrong. In hell, they continue to hate God. This is John MacArthur. In hell, they continue to curse God. In hell, they continue to mock God and blaspheme God and hate Christ. So the punishment never catches up. Notice this. The punishment never catches up to the sin because the sinner never, ever, ever, sinning never, ever ceases. You understand that that's really important. People don't go to hell and then never sin forever and just get punished forever. They go to hell and keep on sinning. All right, well, here's the problem with this. I'm going to go through five of these views. The problem is, first of all, it's a concession that sin is finite. That there isn't, it's not that the infinite sin, you get punished for one sin infinitely, uh, that there's some, you know, that he's basically saying, look, if they didn't keep sinning, they wouldn't be punished forever. So the punishment for sin, in his view, is finite. This is a concession. But there is a possible end under the scenario. Imagine if, for every time they sin again, God strikes them. Well, he can't strike them more than what they just sinned, otherwise they're done. Imagine if, for every curse, there's ten, ten units of punishment. And God gives them 20 units of punishment. Now, even if they curse God one more time, they're even. And they're out. So this kind of relies on God making sure that he doesn't punish them so much that they get out. Uh, we talked about the status argument earlier. And here's William Lane Craig. And here's what he says about it. To reject Christ is to reject God himself. And this is, in a sense, infinite gravity and proportion that therefore deserves infinite punishment. We ought not, therefore, to think of hell primarily as punishment for the array of sins of finite consequence which we have committed, but as the just due for a sin of infinite consequence, namely the rejection of God himself. Well, I've been thinking through the status argument, and why, why, why does this not make sense? Well, I call this, I, we call it the cop-killer argument. Why do we punish someone worse for killing a cop than uh, a, a pedestrian, say? And I think there's only two reasons why God can have a greater status. Uh, one is that he's a, if, just because he's of a greater value, the, the question is, is greater harm has been done. I think that's the only attribute that I can reasonably uh, apply to this. And the problem with harm to the person is, sure, maybe greater harm is done to, let's say you went to college for you know 20 years and wrote all your papers and someone killed you, and then there's some just person who wasted his life and they got killed. Maybe you are of more value in some sense, and so it's a greater sin to kill you. Maybe. But in this case, no harm can come to God because he is omnipotent. So if it's based on harm to the person, if that's what gives him the greater status, God is exempt because you can't hurt God. I mean, you can hurt his feelings, maybe, but I don't know. All right, and then there's harm to society. So I think this is where the status argument may have some merit. If you look at it as a cop-killer argument, what you would say is, for instance, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth. You see, when we suppress the truth, we harm not only ourselves, but the community around us. So it is possible that a sin against God is a greater sin in that it's an attack on the truth itself. All right, so I I admit this is a possible way to look at it, but I think the status argument is a little weak because we're doing harm, if we're measuring it by doing harm, and that's the best way I can uh, measure it, uh, look at it. I don't think that God can't be harmed. All right, let's look at proportionality on the required. This is basically says, look, God does what he wants. This is like the divine command theory. This is not a logical argument. This is a retreat. 
And I have no response to that except for it could be true, but I have no argument against divine command. Whatever God says is right. All right, let's try another one. Depersonalization of the dam. Thank you, N.T. Wright. Here he says, the creatures that still exist in an ex-human state, no longer reflecting their maker in any meaningful sense, can no longer excite in themselves or others a natural sympathy feel for... So basically, uh, what I think he's saying is that they no longer feel or understand pain or can no longer make moral judgments. At this point, they're so depersonalized that they're really not being tormented forever. They sort of cease to exist, but they exist. And and this is what I call this argument. It's called, (laughs) they can't feel it, but God's going to beat them forever and ever and ever. So I don't think depersonalization deals with the infinite nature of the punishment. (laughs) Anyway. All right, let's go for money. All right, so... Uh, there's another reason why this argument fails, and this is what I got from Jerry, and that is that if the more wicked get more punishment in hell, it's possible that they reach the point of depersonalization first, and to some extent are, are, are punished for a lesser amount of time. So, it may work against you in this way too, if you, if you think this quantifiable uh, assumption works. The more wicked reach the point first, and so spend less time suffering in hell. And this is in a chapter that Walls and Brown did in a, in a book in 2010. So maybe I can't blame Jerry for all that because uh, Miss Brown was one of the authors as well. What about universalism? Well, uh, there's different flavors, but as far as I can tell, there's either no retribution in universalism, or I was trying to think of a better universalism just to help them out. You know, And that is that I think if you want to allow for retribution, you would say that Christ takes all the retributive punishment, and the individual only suffers consequential restorative punishment. That is that God is just allowing them to suffer in hell, maybe just to the consequences of their sin, maybe he's not really striking with any retribution, or maybe he is, to get them to repent. Now, I think the problem with this is that the universal view is proportionate, but it's really weak on retribution, because most flavors of universalism, now, you may think that's fine, but if you think retribution has a place, that the wrath of God includes this, then I don't know if universalism is for you, because... But it's, you know, I have to say, universalism does hold its own here pretty well with proportional. I can't just dismiss it, but I do think it's weaker than conditionalism. So, here's what I've said about the other two. Traditionalism is beyond proportion and mercy. The universalist view is proportionate, almost directly, but it may lack a sufficient commitment to retribution. And I think that conditionalism takes into account reasonable proportions of justice along with retribution, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, argument three, completely restored creation. All right, there's a ton of scriptures. We know that, you know, the creation is going to be restored. He'll weed out evil. Heaven must receive him until he restores everything. Sounds universalist, doesn't it? And he may be known to mystery a little according to his good pleasure. Put all things under him, heaven and earth, etc. All right, so this is one side of all things reconciled. But the other part of the reconciliation, which we'll talk about in, in specific, is the end of death. And here is where I think both traditionalism and universalism fail. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Right? We know this, putting everything under his feet. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, ostensibly to be destroyed. Uh, he will wipe away every tear, and there's no more death or mourning or crying, and the old order of things has passed away. No more death or crying or anything. So, under traditionalism, here's their weird thing. They redefine death to mean separation from God. Now there's no more death, and yet there are people separated from God for eternity. So that death that they said is not death, but their new kind of death, is continuing. So I don't see how traditionalism can even look at their own definition of death and, and think that it meets the requirement that death is destroyed. Right? The unrepentant are still separated from God. Okay. Well, here's how Christopher Marshall said in Rethinking Hell. And by the way, that Rethinking Hell compendium, the blue book, is pretty good. A pretty good collection of writings from across time and, and conditionalist writers. It's a nice resource. This results in the impossible scenario where on the one hand, God's conquest of sin and death is deemed complete. Where all things have been reconciled to God. Where every tear has been wiped from every eye and mourning and pain have ended forever. God has become all in all. Yet where, on the other hand, there is one corner of God's dominion where sin, suffering, and rebellion continue to exist, sustained by nothing less than the creative activity of God, the finality of God's victory over evil is fatally compromised by the notion of eternal existence in hell. Well, what about universalism? Here, and under universalism, what we have is we have this kind of resurrection and judgment, and then the end of death, but not really, because we have to wait for an eon for postmortem repentance to save everyone. 
So it creates this weird kind of eschatology where death is defeated, but not yet. Suffering is defeated, but not yet. Tears are defeated, but not yet, for whatever period of time this is. So I think this is not so much a moral fault, but a logical fault with universalism and the idea of a totally restored creation. Now let me give kudos to the universalist. The nice thing about the universalist view is that everyone is restored. That no one is destroyed, unlike the conditionalist scenario, in which, yes, everything that remains is whole, and there's no crying, but there's people that, you know, they're under the rug over here. They're, they're gone. So, let's look at one more problem, possible problem with universal, and that is coercion and the violation of free will. Here's what Jerry said in his book, Hell, the Logic of Damnation. Will a person's freedom at some point be destroyed if his repentance is induced by ever-increasing torment and misery? The choice to submit under these circumstances would not qualify as a free choice. That is, that under universalism, if everyone is saved, the only way that that can really happen is if God coerces the hardest criminals. In fact, Jerry argues for a, a decision. God does not have a morally acceptable way to override a decisive choice for evil. That's, I think, what Jerry is arguing. Right? God, he won't do that. Right? They made a decisive choice, and they cannot freely choose. Now, Jerry is an Arminian, so of course he's going to emphasize free will. The Calvinist doesn't even have a problem with this here. He would just say, look, God chooses to sow mercy on some, and he hardens the others. I don't know what you're belly aching about. So, if you're a traditionalist Calvinist, the free will argument against universalism doesn't mean anything, really. Because you don't really think that is a material question. God has the right to show his anger, he's patient on whom his anger falls, and, and those who are destined for destruction. They would say, look, some are destined, have nothing to do with free will. But if you're an Arminian traditionalist, this is a great argument. Does God have a morally acceptable way to override your decisive choice for evil? Well, in direct response to that, Eric and his co-author have argued this way. And what they would say is immediate awareness of the perfect good, that is, when they get the beatific vision, when they see God, when all of their illusions are removed, when all of our self-deceptions are gone, that the perfect good, that is God, will sink to the natural inclinations of the soul, that love for the good will swamp all potentially contrary effective states. From all of this, it follows that God can guarantee uniform salvation, inducing motives in rational creatures simply by presenting an unclouded vision of himself. That is, that like Calvinists, the universalists would say, God, there's, this is irresistible grace. When you see God, you cannot resist as a creature. So the assumption is, and I don't know if this is the questionable assumption, indwelling sin cannot overcome our desire for God. Is that true? That's how I would ask the question. Indwelling sin could not overcome our desire for God or reverse a decisive decision, a decisive choice for evil. So, what can you say? Do universalism defend itself competently? Perhaps. There's an open question there. So let's just summarize this. So with, with conditionalism, we have a simpler model. Sin and death both feast of the judgment. Death, life, and immortality have simpler, straightforward, biblical meanings while harmonizing the relevant passages, arguably. And here's the summary. Traditionalism denies the fully restored creation, which contains ongoing death, when death is no more. Universal creates a delayed restoration during which death still reigns for some, and it may posit violations of free will. Conditionalism presents a claim end to death and a final creation that lacks any evil. Now, I'm being a little biased here. Let's talk about through a couple challenges. The intermediate state. And I hear, I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong, but I want to make some assertions that if you follow a certain view of the intermediate state, you may be forced to lean more one way than the other because Soul sleep is more congruent with one or two of the views, and even though they both accommodate soul sleep or conscious existence in, in Hades, uh, they lean. So, for instance, I think tradition relies heavily on immortality, and so it leans toward a conscious intermediate state. If you are a believer in soul sleep from Scripture, then you're going to have to reckon with this leaning away from you. Universalism also relies on immortality and post mortem repentance, so it leans toward a conscious intermediate state. If you're a dualist, that's good news. If you're a non-reductive physicalist, I don't know. You're, you're going to have a harder time fitting your theology pieces together, as Ron Perry would say. And then conditionalism leans towards soul sleep and perhaps non-reductive physicalism. If you think that the soul persists in Hades because of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, maybe conditionalism doesn't fit so well with that interpretation. So you need to think about these things. Uh, and I'm not saying which is right or wrong. I'm just saying they lean. Okay, one more. Degrees of punishment. Traditionalism has infinite punishment for all, as I've argued with my little math equation. 
Universalism employs only consequential, consequential restorative punishment, arguably. Conditional relies on the many possible modalities administered at the judgment. Now, I've often heard it said that conditionalism is essentially there's no differential punishment. But I think all of this, no matter what position we hold, can rely on these next three doctrines for differential punishment within our models. It's not just conditionalism, and I think they're pretty straightforward. The first is giving an account, a guilty conscience in the presence of God. We must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Now, there's some contention about what believers will experience in judgment, but certainly our works will be tested. And for those who are unbelievers, this is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Why do we think that Hitler is not going to suffer worse than you know a lesser criminal? I think with a raw conscience before a holy God for whatever period of time God lets us endure. I mean, can you remember the last time you got caught doing something, you know, like cheating on your taxes or, 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 or something you know you should have done, you know. And you've built up your reputation and now you told a dirty joke out of class and you, you regret it, right? But this is that regret times a million. So this is not something to be saying, well, it's not a big deal. No, maybe it is a big deal. How about this? Anguish at the deprivation of life. Under conditionalism, right? Now, throw the useful servant in outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, when a child dies, we lament it because they lost the potential of a full life. When an unbeliever fails to inherit eternal life, that is multiplied. That same experience of failing to gain something of infinite worth. And lastly, everlasting shame. Daniel 12.2 says... Many of those who lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. And I would just say that especially in Middle Eastern cultures, how you are remembered. It doesn't mean they have to experience the shame directly. But Alright, so here's the main argument. Inherent mortality, professional funny justice, completely restored creation. Now I want to give some grades here. Yes, this is subjective, but I want to show where I have to... <laughs> I want to explain a little I want to explain why I gave these grades. Now basically I said these are the three main arguments for conditionalism. And then so but these might not be the three main arguments, for instance, for traditionalism. So against the three arguments for traditionalism, conditionalism might fail really badly. Right? But since I'm choosing these as the standard, I'm measuring these against these. Right? So Traditionalism, I think, fails uh, the inherent mortality test because if mortality is really the truth, then traditionalism just outright denies that. Universalism gets a C because I think they can skate by on that God sustains us, but I think conditionalism explicitly teaches inherent mortality. All right, what about proportional... Again, I hate to pick on the, the, the majority view here, but I, I, cannot, I don't see how it's proportional at all since it's infinite. I understand, and I try to debunk the uh, justifications, whether you think that was sufficient. I think universalism does okay here, but it's weak because it doesn't include retributive judgment. That's my estimation. If you think that's a strength, then you would give universalism an A and conditionalism a C. And lastly, traditionalism, it has ongoing death, so it cannot have any kind of really complete absurd creation. Universalism has this epoch where there where it's not completed yet, and conditionalism, I give it a B, and the reason I don't give it an A is to seem like I'm being impartial, but also um, just the idea that um, it doesn't save all, which universalism does. And so for that reason, maybe we should give universalism a B. So here's the overall grades. This is my comparison. Maybe these are closer together. I don't think this one can do much better than it's done here. Uh, and then I just want to have a closing thought here. You know, many of you should not become teachers because you know we will receive a stricter judgment. And Jesus said, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Um, I see the traditional view as a huge stumbling block to the gospel. And I think that God's going to hold us to account for raising an offense that doesn't need to be there. And so I think we need to think hard about our theology of this. Alright, that's it. So I guess we're at Q&A. <laughs> Comments, questions? I am not a professional philosopher. I'm an, I'm an MDiv student, right? So we've got a couple pros up here. It's a little uh, disconcerting to have them sitting here. But, uh, there you go. Any comments, questions? Um, 
go, going back to the status uh, argument, I, I, there's a comment there I hadn't thought about. Um, that I would like to explore more, but I wonder what, what you think. You say there's no true harm done to God, or you said something like that. He's unable to be harmed because uh, he's omnipotent. Okay. Um, so I guess if, if, if somebody's going to try to take the divine sort of passability approach or uh, like pathos, like Mopan, sort of God is harmed, that sort of like eternal life of God, uh, isn't it arguable that, um, I guess you could say God is actually harmed more than anybody else? Uh, like infinitely more. But how is he harmed? I mean, it would be well. I, I mean, that, that's sort of what I'm trying to. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just wondering if, if that's even something plausible. I, I mean, I, I that's it's a hard thing to conceive of. But I I I think of Aesop's fable where the gnat landed on the bull's horn and said, "I apologize for you know for being a burden." You know, I think even though our sin is serious, it's serious in our its effect on us in creation. I don't think God is fragile enough to be. Harmed in any real sense, but well, one way you might you might flesh this out, and again, it's not like you, you turn you, you put it in terms of power. Obviously, you can't hurt God's power, right. Right. Like this, right? But you could arguably hurt God's reputation, right? Mm-hmm. So sinners sin, ignore God, flaunt God, etc., 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 show utter disrespect for God, get away with it seemingly, right? Mm-hmm. And so God is the Holy One of Israel, the one who deserves all worship. You know, his reputation is harmed, arguably, by that kind of behavior that is, that, that, you know, the slides. You can make a case like that, maybe. Yeah, but is that an infinite sin? Maybe. Now, the, the Lutheran scholastics have this idea, of, they call it vindicatory justice, very end of retributive justice. And their ideas... Um, very similar to the idea of retributive justice that uh, the philosopher Gene Hampton developed a couple of decades ago in this book, Forgiveness and Mercy. Uh, she didn't apply it to God. But the, the idea is that an offense against an individual makes a claim about that individual that is false. It devalues them. It, it is communicating something, and this falls in what you were saying, communicate something that is a false claim about their value. That, you know, if, you know the, the haughty nobleman who spits on the peasant and kicks them. And there's, this person is communicating um, that this peasant is worthless. Okay? And this is a false claim that needs more than just to be pointed out that's false. It needs to be repudiated with a counterclaim. This is and right. you think that would fall under the right. passage I mentioned about suppressing the truth? Right, yeah. And I think it fits in with that. But there's, uh, you need a counterclaim that you need to respond to this offense uh, proportionally, in, uh, in proportion to the degree of error that is represented. And what the Lutheran uh, scholastics argued was that if you... Um, make this error error in relation to God, God's worth is infinitely great. If you are making an error, that means you're valuing God finitely. The difference is always going to be infinite. And so that was the the basis. I don't think the status argument is without merit. I'm just trying to debunk it because I don't like it, but also I don't know if it's sufficient to justify eternal torment. Can I just go for different grades? (laughs) <laughs> sure, you want to, yeah. Okay, so yeah. inherent mortality. Yeah, so, so, so mortality, yeah. You don't have to be a Platonist to believe uh, that God sustains all people forever um, by virtue of the fact that there are creatures made in his image created for love and God, responding to being in relation to him. And so being a human being is being in an eternal relationship with God one way or another. That's what it means to be a human being. So you're saying so, the Imago, so Dei, the Imago Dei includes immortality? Dei, Imago Deo means being related to God forever. Because he created you, God does not undo his creation. Well, that's a big assumption a, to a, interpret that. So A, a for tradition. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, 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 you know, the, the way MacArthur put this, you know, might be a little loaded, but I, I think you can defend this. If you just uh, continue to stay away from God, you continue to refuse to enter the gates of heaven, persist in staying outside the gates of heaven by your own free choice, well, if you choose to do that, okay, it seems fitting. Traditionalism A. Uh, now, the last one, I'll give, I'll give the, the universalists the A. I'll give you guys the best a C, because you've got, you got these 
terrible memories of people that are absolutely obliterated forever and ever. So you guys will get an A on that. I mean, you get okay. the best to see. Well, I get to see. And I, I give us maybe a B minus on that. So I think, you know, I agree. You can have a hey, how can you give me a C and you give traditionalism a B minus when it's ostensibly because, a worse punishment? Because God is because God has continued to love these people and invite them into the gates of heaven. Oh, God. because you're a postmodern repentist traditional. Well, of course. Right, so that's that's an unusual flavor, but yeah. It's a whole different grade. i got a uh, segue kind of on that. Sure, I, uh, Full sure. disclosure, I'm a real newbie in this. But I have been reading Fudge for a, a couple of years, and so I'm kind of moving to the traditionalist way, but... I've developed a really quick elevator speech because I talk about it so much to friends and family and all that. And what I say is about uh, the God's love of the world. If you believe, you will have eternal life. You will not perish, but have eternal life. So we weren't born with a mortal soul, I say, in the elevator, because perish means you perish. What does perish mean? Live forever. What about the second death? Live forever. And it completely... Right, so I think the the philosophical case, quite honestly, I mean, Eric's book, I, I love both of the, Jerry's book and Eric's book, but I, I recently read Eric's book, and it's very compelling, and I've been quipping the whole time here, and I hope you appreciate this. I'd say if I didn't know the scriptures, I would be converted to... to <laughs> By Eric's book. <laughs> and I do think that the philosophical <laughs> I do think the philosophical case for conditionalism is not airtight, and actually the philosophical and by any means, the philosophical case for universalism is also pretty good. I do not think that the traditional view has a lot to stand on, but um, I do thousand years of general church consensus. Right, I mean well I know but you should have told the reformers that. They didn't the reformers didn't trust tradition either. But uh, anyway, uh, we see ourselves as a modern reform movement, of course. But the exegetical arguments, I think, are where conditionalism really shines. Because I think universalism does a valiant effort to, to dissuade us that parish death and all that aren't permanent. But I don't know how compelling. I haven't found compelling yet, but we're all in process. Uh, Follow-up, if I may. Uh, since I've been here for the last couple of days... I've read, been hearing, I would probably say dominantly, the conscious ability to change your mind in hell. Where is the biblical basis for that? I don't know. We could ask Jerry. The gates, of, the gates of heaven are open forever. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. But Revelation says people come in and out. The gates then what is the second death? What, what is the second death? What is the second death? It's, the, it's being separated from God again, but it doesn't mean it's final. So right, so Jerry is a unique uh, character because he's a traditionalist who also believes in postmortem repentance and sanctifying purgatory. So he's not your typical traditionalist, and so he's kind of ameliorated some of the weaknesses of the traditional view by taking on a couple added features, and uh, that's interesting. So, uh, if you elaborate more on uh, what you first talked about on the soul's dependence on the body. You mentioned the Alzheimer's example. I just didn't catch that full. I'm just saying that we have no naturalistic evidence that shows that non-corporeal humans even exist or have any influence in the real life. What we do see is that when the body degenerates, the soul's faculties degenerate at the same time. So unless some other principle is is uh, is introduced, I don't see any naturalistic reason why we should assume the soul is immortal. That's that's it. Because it depends on the body, at least somewhat. And, of course, we can't know how much. Could you, could you share a little bit more on that in light of um, near-death or after-death experience? Yeah, near-death experiences are... I wouldn't base my theology on that. Uh, I, I, it's an interesting evidence of the persistence of the soul outside the body. I don't think it's conclusive enough. I, you so know, you it's call it evidence, because just a moment, a moment ago you said... Well, it is evidence. Well, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's really great evidence. And for instance, I'll give you another example. Houdini and his wife were known spiritists. And one of the things they did is they promised that whoever died first, the other one would contact the living one. And you know, they really tried that, and of course, it didn't happen. And even in the scriptures, there is very little evidence of non-corporeal human spirits uh, visiting us. Now there's the witch at Endor, uh, there's the, uh, is that what it is? The witch at, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, transfiguration, right? But, of course, there are explanations for those difficult uh, passages. For instance, the transfiguration, Jesus calls a vision. And it may have been just a vision and not an actual visitation by Elijah and Moses. 
but now we're in the gray area where everybody has something in the scriptures that they have to, you know, muscle with because it doesn't fit neatly. Just one last follow-up. Um, would you say that Alzheimer's is more of a, uh, more like the, the brain's malfunctioning, just like in mental illness, there's a chemical imbalance that causes the brain to malfunction. Mm-hmm. And so the mind, being a faculty of the brain, is affected by it because the mind, in a sense, can't override or um, superimpose itself to cause the body to do what it needs to do. But the soul is a malfunction. Well, that's the argument, but I mean, it depends how we define the soul, right? I mean, if we kind of do it in a classic dualist way where the functions of the soul are intelligence, emotion, will, uh, those things certainly degrade over time. Yeah, is the soul still kind of trapped in there and with full faculties but can't express itself through the physical body? Perhaps. But I, perhaps. That's that's a good counter-argument. All right, one more question any, or comment, and then we'll wrap up. All right, well, thanks so much for uh, putting up with my uh, diatribe. Thank you.